we should set up a structure so that um, we can come up with the best science we can for the needs of the society. Hello and welcome to FISI. Joining me today is Manuela Fernandez Pinto. Manuela is an associate professor of philosophy at Universidad de los Andes, Bogota. She works in philosophy of science, social epistemology, and feminist philosophy. And today we're going to zoom in and focus on an article that she published a few years ago titled Commercialization and the Limits of Well-Ordered Science. Manuela, thanks for joining me today. Thank you very much, Jacob. It's my pleasure. So I, I really like this article. I use it for teaching my students. Uh, it covers a really important uh, topic and it introduces students to the topic. So the topic is well-ordered science, this important notion from the philosopher Philip Kitcher. Um, before we dive into the really substantive part of your article, can you just describe what well-ordered science is? Sure. So um, Philip Kitcher, as you were saying, uh, developed this uh, ideal of well-ordered science in two of his books. The first one is uh, Science, Truth, and Democracy. And the second one is Science in a Democratic Society. And in both books, what he wants to propose is a way um, in which, which we should think about the social organization of science in terms of um, democratic societies at large. And he proposes this ideal that he calls, calls well-ordered science as a normative uh, prescriptive way in which we should organize science. And um, I think one of, of the main points uh, of, of the ideal is to um, set up a structure of science organizations such that the science that we produce in our societies, in our democratic societies in particular, serve uh, the needs of those societies. Um, he thinks that this does not happen uh, naturally or without guidance, but that we should set up a structure so that um, we can come up with the best science we can for the needs of the societies. Okay, um, so how do we do that? Um, he, he offers a kind of recipe for, sure. for, for yes. that, so. <laughs> so he, the idea of well order science um, in my reading of it, um, he divides it in, in three, um, let's say different stages. Uh, he, he talks about um, a first phase where we are supposed to determine which lines of research society should conduct or scientists in that society should conduct. Um, another phase which deals with the research as such. And the third phase uh, in which uh, societies should decide what to do with the results of the research conducted. And um, as part of that, um, uh, of those processes and in particular of the processes of uh, setting the agenda and then deciding how to implement the results. Um, Kitcher thinks that we should um, develop something that he calls ideal deliberations. Maybe we, we, we're gonna talk a little bit more about this um, later. Uh, but basically what he has in mind is that uh, we should um, incorporate citizens that are representative of society at, at large and involve them in discussions regarding uh, what science to, to develop and how to use the science that we have developed so that um, the science that is developed and implemented in society is chosen in a more democratic way. I think this is what he has in mind. And then regarding the, the middle uh, process, let's say the, the scientific uh, research as such, uh, he 
in my reading again, he he does not have like um, democratizing mechanisms in in that uh, phase as such. He he doesn't think that citizens should you know go into the lab and, um, and talk to scientists and discuss what they are doing. They he is more uh, in that particular phase. He thinks that we should let scientists do their thing and trust the scientific process. Part of the very idea of well-ordered science is a claim about what the aim of science is. And a kind of common view is that the aim of science is just to discover truths. So we, we should just like let scientists do what they want. They'll come up with you know discoveries about the world, and that's fine. So well-ordered science seems to depart from that sort of common view. Can you can you say a bit more about that? What's wrong with that common view? Well, that common view of science, of course, as you know, has been um, discussed and criticized, or you know, complemented in many different ways by different philosophers of science. A very popular and different notion of the aims of science is the idea that science should aim at uh, empirical adequacy instead of truth. And uh, this is a view that um, someone like um, Bas van Frassen or Helen Long, you know, might might defend. Uh, So not all philosophers of science um, think that the aim of science is true. Uh, For Kitcher, I think, uh, um, well, he he disagrees in a way uh, with the idea that um, the aim of science is just truth. uh, Because he thinks that uh, truth is not enough in the sense that um, we have truths about the world all over the place, but not all of them are interesting uh, to us. Um, or we don't have uh, what he calls a natural curiosity or uh, is, um, the, many of the truths of science are not salient to us in principle. And so, and, and when you think about it, it, this makes a lot of sense, right? I, I can know a lot of truths about the world that I'm not interested in, right? So I can, I could count how many beans are on my countertop or something like this, but this is something that is not significant to me. And this is precisely the word that, that he uses. See, he thinks that a better way to describe the aim of science is to say that uh, science aims at significant truths. And, and then he also claims that it is not significant in just the practical sense, but we are also looking for epistemically significant truths. And um, basically, I think what he means by this is uh, uh, these truths that are relevant to us as a society, th- that we, we think are important, that the knowledge of which is important uh, for us as a society. And uh, this is determined in different ways. In, in his book, Science, Truth, and Democracy, he proposes um, something called the significant graphs. And so this, uh, of, um, I would say um, a visual way of understanding how the different interests that scientists have regarding a particular research topic come together and this involve also their um, like broader societal con- concerns, if you wish, um, and how the, they all come together uh, to study a particular research topic. And so, um, so yeah, when we, when we do science, when scientists are in the lab trying to understand something or in the field, they are trying to understand something that is uh, of importance to our society. Um, uh, they are trying to acquire knowledge that is particularly significant to our society. And I think that's, yeah, that's an important feature of uh, how Kitcher understand the aims of science. Okay. And how do we determine what those things are? You mentioned ideal deliberations earlier. So, so is our ideal deliberation supposed to tell us what those significant truths are? So, yeah, so this is um, a very important um, item let's say, of, um, of Kitcher's um, ideal of well-ordered science. He claims that uh, in order to achieve well-ordered science, we need to have these ideal deliberations with citizens that should discuss that, well, in the first place, they have to be representative of the society they're living in, 
and they have to discuss, have these general discussions about what signs do we want? And, uh, and of course, the signs we want should, um, in a way, uh, be based on the sciences, the signs we need, no? the knowledge we need as a society. And so um, these ideal deliberations, however, are not made on the citizens' intuitions or knowledge about uh, scientific, uh, any knowledge about scientific issues that they might have uh, to begin with. But he also claims, and, and this is, I think, a very important point, he also claims that the citizens need, need to be tutored by the experts, that is the scientists relevant for the particular issue they are discussing. And so scientists should not have these deliberations in a vacuum, but they should know something about the science related to the issues they are discussing. And um, this means that they must be tutored by the scientists or the scientists tell them, I, I guess this is what he has in mind, tell them like the relevant but minimal science needed to understand and discuss the issues. Of course, the citizens are not going to go into the lab and do the science, but they, they require some minimal understanding of what's going on in the scientific community of the research. They, it's relevant to their discussions. And so they are tutored in order to have those discussions. And I think this, this is a particularly important point of the, of the whole process um, because one can ask the question then how, how democratic is this process if the scientists are already in a way establishing what uh, like the framework, the conceptual framework that uh, should be in place in order to start the discussion. So someone might claim this is not democratic at all, it's all it's technocratic. Um, on the contrary, and so um, yeah, this, this has been a point of contention, I think, as a reaction to the the ideal deliberations that he proposes. Okay, okay, but in a very abstract sense, the the idea sounds quite compelling. So we want to know what scientists should be directing their efforts towards. Um, okay, the answer to that is deploy this notion of well-ordered science involving these ideal deliberations, and we'll have a democratic way of setting the research agenda. But in your article, you offer some criticisms of this idea. You argue that there are these three limitations to well-ordered science. So if I, I want to see if I, I understand these limitations. Let's see if I, I, I pass my own test. So. Um, one criticism is we can't know what the outcomes of such ideal deliberations would be, in part just because the very idea of an ideal deliberation is itself just so abstract. Um, so it's hard to know how to predict what the actual outcome would be. And the second criticism is that Kitcher supposes that science is a public good, but as you argue in your article, a lot of science today is is done privately. So this, the science is funded by private companies and the results are owned by private companies. So that's a far cry from being a public good. And then the third problem you note is that the, the theory of well-ordered science assumes that there's this distinction between the internal and external aspects of scientific organization. So is, did I get that right? Do I pass the, yes, pass the test? Yes, that's yeah. correct. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Very good. So, so can we kind of briefly unpack each of these three criticisms? Can you, sure. can you walk, walk me through them? Sure. Uh, well, let me start by saying that I think they are related as I, as I argue further in the, in the piece. But um, yeah, I think to begin with, the ideal of world order science is an ideal. So it's prescriptive, uh, as I was saying from the beginning. So it, 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 it does not pretend to be a description of how science works and it's far from that, as, as, as you can easily see. Um, but uh, so my, my point here is that the ideal is too idealistic in the sense that it, it um, uh, starts from um, setting up a structure of science organization that is a way, um, uh, is very far away from the current state of science organization. And um, I think, this is a problem because uh, 
because of the aims of the ideal that he has. Of course, when philosophers propose an ideal, well, may, maybe some propose ideals just for the sake of it, but uh, of course, uh, I think Kitcher um, goes into the, the whole trouble of proposing the ideal of well-ordered science in order to draw us a picture of what can be done or, or to have, let's say, a, a guide uh, um, or um, uh, a structure towards which we should aim, right? Like uh, in order to have a better organized science than, than what we have today. And so he, he does have this idea that the, that the ideal can contribute to making changes to the current organization, social organization of science and make it better. And I think it is just, if you have that, that idea in mind, then the ideal of well-ordered science is just too far away, too disconnected from the current state of uh, science organization so that we can actually bridge the gap between the two. And, and so, yeah, one of the, the conclusions, I guess, of, of the article is that uh, it is fine to propose ideals, we need that, um, but we should propose ideals that are doable or, you know, that we, we should propose ideals where we can also propose words, uh, ways to bridge the gap between the current state and the ideal. And I think that's missing from, from Kitcher's pic, uh, picture. I think I also have some quotes in, in the article for those who are interested in your audience. Um, I also have some quotes where, where he himself recognizes that, that perhaps the ideal is too idealistic in that sense. I like those quotes, by the way, they were very insightful for me. Um, so uh, let me see if I understand. Um, I wanna focus on this issue of ideals are meant to be ideals, they're prescriptive, they're not meant to be descriptive, like descriptively true about some domain. So Kitcher might say to you, look, Manuela, I'm just describing an ideal and you're noting that real science today is far from that ideal, but that's not an argument against well-ordered science. That's a complaint about mm -hmm. the current state of science today. And I think your rejoinder to that is, it's fine to articulate ideals, qua ideals, but they should be action guiding to some degree. Um, so for example, if I have an ideal of say losing five kilograms because I wanna feel better and be healthier, there's clear steps that I can take to do that. But if I just have this ideal of losing five kilograms without any idea of what that could mean in my day-to-day -day life, then, then it's not a useful ideal. Is, is that the kind of argument that, that you're proposing? Yeah, so, yeah, so I think uh, um, that this is the case because he himself wants to propose an ideal that contributes to the discussion of what to do with the problems of current. Um, science, right? Uh, especially problems related to the relation between science and democratic societies. And so, so yeah, if you, if you propose an, an ideal that is too far away from the current state and you don't show how to bridge the gap between those two, then it is not useful. Uh, it might be not very nice and, you know, like well articulated and a wonderful world ideal world, but it is not useful uh, for us um, to think about ways to change the current organization of science to make it better. And so, so yeah, so I think, um, and this is, this is something I think of philosophy of science in general, not just Kitcher's ideal, but uh, when you propose an ideal, it should be one that uh, you can connect with the current state of affairs so that it actually can as you were saying, guide our actions towards the ideal. And, and then you can criticize the ideal as an ideal too, but you know, in, in particular, I think a, a good criterion to, to determine, uh, or at least to judge whether an ideal is a, is a good one, is uh, to see how I think the author should propose 
how to connect the ideal to current reality and how to move from what we have now to the towards the ideal. Okay, okay. So part of your argument that there is this gap between the current state of science and this ideal of well-ordered science is the argument that the current way in which the social organiza organization of science um, manifests is in the hands of the science, the scientific research agenda is controlled by private industry and private industry, not hundred percent of science, but say 70% of science, private industry determines what kinds of projects get pursued, how they get pursued and how the results are applied. Is that the, is that the idea? Sure. Yeah. So, um, in, um, our world today, uh, in our globalized world today, uh, science, science, like not only science, but uh, scientific and technological development broadly conceived are uh, mainly funded by private companies and conducted in private settings. And so um, this, this idea that science and the products of science, the scientific knowledge produced by scientific research is publicly owned is no longer a fact. So we live in a world where that is no longer the case. We have uh, all this legislation that has been implemented probably since the end of the Cold War, a war that has led us to a system of privately owned science and scientific knowledge. Um, and, and so it is very far away from this uh, system of public knowledge that Kitcher um, sets up as you know, the starting point for his uh, well-ordered science. So in order to, and this means that in order to achieve well-ordered science in Kitcher's terms, then we would need to completely change our legislative systems regarding scientific research and the laws that also regulate uh, scientific research in trans transnationally and uh, you know the patents and IP systems that uh, regulate our, our uh, scientific and technological products worldwide. And it is in no way clear how this can be done. This is something that we struggle with all the time. I mean, I think many, many of us philosophers of science know that the, that the current system, IP system regarding scientific uh, research and technological research is a problem and has many flaws, but it is not clear at all what can be done to change it. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so this kind of problem seems especially relevant to practical sciences like medical science. So mm -hmm. in medicine, a huge proportion of the research is funded and controlled by private industry. Mm. Right. Would you say that for some more basic sciences, like say particle physics or I don't know, ecology, um, that the notion of well-ordered science might be more descriptively accurate that um, there's Attainable. not such a, yeah. yeah, exactly. It's more feasible. There's not such a gap between the present state of affairs and what the ideal would say. Yeah, the, that, that might be the case, but let me say two things. The first one is that um, these sciences, I, I'm not sure about ecology, but let's talk about particle physics. So these sciences um, are also the sciences that are not so clearly connected with human affairs, you know, that are not so directly connected with social issues. And so uh, given that the ideal of well-ordered science is concerned uh, for the most part with um, significant truths that are, I, I'm, and I'm not saying that, you know, particle physics does not render significant truths, it probably does in Kitcher's view, but um, the, these ideal deliberations that the, sign, that the citizens would have to de uh, deal with, with uh, uh, well, would be very likely about issues that have uh, direct social impacts and that, uh, or, or 
I mean, I, I'm guessing that the citizens would also need to discuss whether they should fund something that has a direct social impact versus some research that is very disconnected to something like that. Uh, and so that is interesting because then uh, the, the idea of well order science seems to be targeting precisely the sciences that are more likely to contribute to social benefit, I would say. Um, and some basic science might well fit into that. I'm not saying that, that it doesn't, but uh, it, is, it is framed in a way in which uh, the social needs are salient. And so I think those, like if you think about, I don't know, astrophysics or something like that, those sciences are, I think, um, not set aside, but maybe are not given the priority than others like clinical research might be given, I would say. Uh, perhaps, I don't know what he thinks about this, but this would be uh, something that we can think about. One of the main arguments that you make in the article is that um, it's hard to predict what the outcome of this ideal sure, deliberation sure. would be. So, so here we are, you and I speaking about what uh, might get prioritized or what might not get prioritized. And it does involve a lot of sort of counterfactual thinking. Uh, right, yeah. Would it be the case that particle physics and string theory gets prioritized or not? Or would it be um, another vaccine for COVID? Um, so yeah, sure. it's a bit hard to know what the, these ideal deliberators would, would say, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, and the other point that I was going to make is that, um, well, part of the, of the broad changes in the social organization of science that we've seen in the past decades is precisely a reduction in the funding of basic science uh, because the commercialized framework um, privileges sciences that, that are applied, right? That have direct uh, commercial interests. And so uh, basic research on particle physics or astrophysics or whatnot, uh, has been produced. And so um, what we see today is that research, um, as more and more research is conducted in the private settings and is funded by private companies, less and less of that research goes to basic science. And um, well, not surprisingly, the basic science that we still do remains in the universities and is mostly publicly funded. And so presumably as the public funding of science continues to reduce, uh, then the, the funding for basic science also will continue to, will continue to reduce. And so, so, so yeah, so that's another, another way in which uh, I, you could say that, uh, yeah, it is, it is interesting to talk about particle physics or astrophysics or, or any other basic science. Um, but uh, in order to think about science uh, in the sense of the majority of scientific research done today, we have to focus on these applied fields such as medicine, because that's where the, um, yeah, the, the gross amount, you know, like the, the majority of research uh, lies and so um, yeah so this is very as a philosopher of science this is very interesting too right because we we were taught I mean philosophy of science up to the middle of the 20th century was all about physics you know physics was the paradigm example of uh, everything a scientific theory should be and a science should look like and it turns out that it is right now a minority of the type of research that is being done. Uh, and so, so I also think that when we talk about science, we should focus on what we call science today in most of the cases. And that, that science is, uh, yeah, something like pharmaceutical research. That's, you know, what's you, you know, running the show nowadays. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. If you, if you just added up the resources devoted to studying different kinds of hypotheses plausibly, pharmaceutical research would be near the top, right? Right, yeah, so there, there are a few fields that, that are like, you know, the top five uh, 
research fields uh, in, in, in the US, for instance, and I think pharmaceuticals, well, everything that has to do with um, uh, research on chemicals, which includes pharmaceutical research, uh, is up there. But it, yeah, and you see also there are things like, um, you know, glyphosate, like Roundup research for the companies like Monsanto, things like that. And another one that is up in the top is uh, the development of um, a, a ICTs. So everything that has to do with innovations in communication technology is also a very important uh, uh, set of uh, scientific research today. Yeah. So in some sense, these facts about science today motivate some change. <laughs> to the way the research agenda gets set. So Kitcher might just say, yeah, the fact that so much science is being done on like weed killers and pharmaceuticals that like don't do much for us is an argument that we ought to change the way the research agenda gets set. And he's got a theory, and but you've criticized it. So it's a really important subject. Um, how, if Kitcher's wrong, if well-ordered cool. science is uh, not feasible, as you've argued, then what would be a feasible and attractive alternative? Yeah, so, so let me tie that to my third critique of the argument, which I think is relevant to this point. So I also claim that Kitcher presupposes a distinction between the internal and the external aspects of science. And I try to illustrate this by really emphasizing how he devised the, the research uh, stages or phases. And as I was saying in the beginning, uh, he, he has the second stage where scientific research is conducted. And then citizens, these ideal deliberators, can say something about um, you know, maybe ethical constraints on how the research is done. So you cannot experiment on human subjects uh, and coerce them into you know, doing things that they don't want to, um, and that's fine. But they cannot really um, make decisions or help the scientists make decisions in their research process. And so he, he really says that you, you just let the scientists do their thing, and then we wait for the outcomes. And, and when uh, we have the outcomes, then we decide how, how do we apply them. And, and so this is why I call it like a, like a uh, black boxing of the research process, because he really doesn't get into how can we democratize the, the, the research process internally. But um, I think this picture is wrong. I, I don't think that we can actually uh, distinguish between these internal and external aspects of science as he does, or as he presupposes in his framework of well-ordered science. And I think we cannot do that uh, precisely because uh, of because of the commercialized framework we are we are in right now. Um, and I, I give a couple of examples in the paper of how the funding and the setup, uh, let, let's say the um, the places where the research is conducted, have important effects. They impact the way the research is conducted internally, if you want to say so, right? So they, it is not like, okay, we, we have uh, some conditions to start with, and then the scientists do their thing, and then we get the results. It is um, more like um, the, the, the private companies that are um, setting up the research and providing the funding for the research are really changing the way, like methodologically, the way that scientists conduct the research. So the scientists are doing things different in, in that black box. They are doing things different uh, because of who is funding them and because of you know, the places they are doing the research uh, in. And, and so something that would have been called an external factor, like the funding agent of the of the research, is actually not external at all. It is having very internal consequences in the research. And so, so to start asking the question, 
then what can we do? If, if it's not wall order signs, then what can we do? I think, uh, well, we have to start acknowledging that. This is one first step that I think is very important. We have to start acknowledging that the funders of the science do affect the so-called internal processes of scientific research, the internal stages of scientific research. And they are affecting it in, in very different ways. I know, well, you, you have written about um, many ways in which this happens in clinical research, and uh, we've seen it in other fields as well. And so uh, start, starting by uh, understanding how they do that, I think is a very important first step to think of ways of uh, perhaps, we'll say breaking the connections between that funding or how the, this funding in particular is affecting the way we conduct research. In cases, of course, in which we consider that this is detrimental to the science, right? Because maybe this is also controversial, right? There are people who argue that, that the private funding of science is fine and we should just let it be. Um, because you know it incentivizes research and all these um, uh, laws that we have um, that protect the private funding of science are fine precisely because they incentivize um, technological and scientific innovation. So this is also controversial. But in those cases uh, in which we've seen that the private funding of science is actually corrupting the scientific process, well, uh, understanding that I think can help us understand ways of stopping that influence. Okay, this is very interesting. Thank you. So the final question I want to ask you is just about how your thinking about the subject has developed. So you wrote this article in 2015. And so have you developed your thoughts about this idea of well-ordered science? Yeah, this is I, actually I thought this uh, invitation was really great because I, I, I wrote the, this, this article. Well, actually, this article was part, initially part of my dissertation of one of the first chapters of my dissertation. So I wrote this like in 2012 or something <laughs> like that. So it's been almost 10 years since I thought about it. Um, but uh, yeah, I definitely. So one of the things that I did in that chapter was, of course, to talk about, well, two of the most important uh, philosophers of science and their views on the social organization of science. So one was Philip Kitcher and the other one was Helen Longino. And I presented some critiques to both of them regarding um, how uh, the current commercialized framework of scientific uh, development um, affects in one way or the other their views. Uh, so kind of, a uh, bottom-up approach, if you want to. And so, and, and that's, you know, that's typical from, a, a, I think, a PhD dissertation. So you start, you know, like looking at what the famous philosophers have said, and then you, you try to say something new about them. Uh, so, so yeah, so I, I haven't um, continued to work on Kitcher or, or Longino you know, as such. I've been doing much more of my own uh, research after that and you know, thinking more carefully about this, uh, how this commercialization of science is really affecting uh, our, our um, scientific, uh, uh, our scientific research, but also how is it affecting the knowledge we produce and how it's affecting uh, different communities that um, could have benefited from other type of research or, or the same research with different angles, you know? And so, so yeah, so I've been, I, so no, I haven't thought of Kitcher and Ideal Deliberations anymore, but I, I, I have been concerned with uh, strategies to democratize science, which is something that he is concerned about, right? Like how, how do we, make this connection between science and democracies. And I think that is a question that is still in my work. How do we, what is the role of the experts in democratic societies, of scientific experts in democratic societies? Uh, of course, on the one hand, we don't wanna trust the experts blindly because then we would have a technocracy and not a democratic society. And on the other hand, we, we 
do want to pay attention to what our best science is saying about the issues that concern us. So in Colombia right now, we've been having public debates on, as I was mentioned before, glyphosate and the Roundup um, of Monsanto, which is used for these genetically modified crops, but in Colombia is widely used for the spreading of illegal crops of coca plantations. And so uh, it's a, a very, very political topic in Colombia, whether we should spread glyphosate or not in, in our fields. And another issue, which is also, I think, very popular worldwide is the, the issue about fracking. And, and then what should we do about, uh, or is, is fracking, um, uh, you know, uh, environmentally friendly or not and why and what's the evidence etc and and these are all issues in which you know like both parts bring their experts to say you know uh, to to support their own views and and I think there is um, space there for philosophers of science to try to to at least give some conceptual clarity of what's going on to understand what the experts are taking as the relevant evidence and why they are taking this as the relevant evidence and not other type of evidence, um, et cetera. And so, yeah, so this is an issue that I've been uh, worrying about. I've been also concerned with um, attempts. So this is, this is another interesting topic. The, the industries that fund scientific research are also uh, interested in these democratizing strategies. So it is, uh, of course, Kitcher had it like this. Um, he he was going to propose the way in which you know the the democratization is going to was going to take place, uh, but the industry itself has has seen that these democratizing strategies are profitable. You know, <laughs> they, there's commercial interest in those democratizing strategies, and so you know, like making their, res their research more um, gender friendly or racial friendly or things like that, you know? So I've been also doing research into um, Bizel, the first drug approved for the use of African-Americans exclusively in the US. Um, research on, yeah, uh, diseases or medication that only treat uh, women's uh, diseases and how this is done differently for women than for men. And so I wrote an article with um, uh, my advisor, Jenny Kurani, on uh, how this happens uh, with mammography screening and uh, what's the like uh, commercial interests that are behind. Well, it was broadly about the values behind the research on mammography, mammography screening, but uh, part of that was about uh, the commercial interests that are behind mammography screenings. Um, and um, I have this uh, piece on Vi and Vidal and, and so on. So yeah, so this, this topic of the democratization of uh, scientific research has been uh, in my mind since I, I wrote this article. And yeah, and in general, what has happened is that I've, I've stopped thinking so much about, you know, this uh, frameworks that were established by other philosophers and I've started to think on my own about um, what can be done. I, I'm also writing um, a piece on what, what can be done um, without thinking about ideal frameworks, but what can actually be done to, to break that connection between the, the private funding and the commercial interests that seem to be corrupting some part of cl clinical research and so on. Um, so yeah, so in a way I, I stopped thinking about Kitcher, but I <laughs> I haven't stopped thinking about the, the problem at the core, I guess. Right, okay. Well, thank you very much, Manuela, for this interesting conversation. No, thank, thanks to you for the invitation. This was very fun. It's been a pleasure.